Do you wish your gardener did more than just mow the lawn and blow the leaves? Today we'll hear about fine gardener services and how much more you can enjoy your garden with a little help from a specialist. I'm Grace Trafton of The Better Part. Stay tuned. <music> Our guest today, Jenny Babbitt, has been lovingly tending to plants all her life. Jenny is a certified environmental horticulturist and a Santa Clara County green gardener. She's one of the gardeners that specialize in the fine or detail-oriented aspects of garden maintenance, and her garden solutions emphasize water-wise and environmentally friendly gardening for people and pets. Welcome, Jenny. It's so good to see you here today. Thank you, Grace. I'm delighted to be here. So first tell us, why did you choose fine gardening as a career? Well, having always tended to plants and played with them, quite honestly, I play with them, um, I had an opportunity to change careers a while back, and I know gardening is my absolute passion and my love. So I, it, it was complete natural for me to get into the finer aspects of it. I love the detailed level of gardening. So how did you go about becoming a fine gardener and what's involved in becoming a certified environmental horticulturist? Well, as my passion, the fine gardening aspect and what I've learned and known has just evolved like a garden does through trial and error through study, through sharing with other gardeners. I've learned much over the years. The Foothill College offers a tremendous environmental horticulture program. And within that program, it touches on the many disciplines of horticulture. So you may go, someone who's looking to start a career, someone who's an established professional can go to hone their skills a bit. And in the end, it's toward the certification it touches on sustainable programs. It touches from design to construction to maintaining all kinds of identification. There are all kind of fun classes in there as well. And so Foothill will be, it has been, and will remain a great resource for me. Great. And tell us about the Santa Clara Green Gardener Program. Well, the, um, the official name of it is the Santa Clara Valley Urban Runoff Pollution Prevention Program. Quite a mouthful, huh? Exactly. <laughs> and it may be it is such because it is very important that um, this is a consortium of 15 agencies within the county, all with a common interest and a common charter to take care of the bay. We all need to be concerned about the bay and the runoff. Much of that comes from what we put in our gardens runs into the storm drains and into the bay. And it's remarkable what little bits of fertilizers, pesticides can really affect the streams and the bay down the long run. Many people employ a basic service gardener to take care of their garden and patio spaces, but uh, especially as they get older. But what service does a fine gardener provide that's different from a basic standard service gardener? Well, on a basic standard level, I think for the most part, people refer to them as mow and blow. That's right. <laughs> and that's what they do. It's a tremendous service. Um, it's wonderful to come home to. And they are basically running through with power machinery, and they're mowing, and they're blowing the leaves, and you come home, and it's delightful, and it's really pretty. Um, think of the difference in getting your house cleaned. Someone could come through and blow like crazy, blow the dust out, blow the dirt out the door, and be all good, and it's clean but you don't want someone to come into your bathroom and hose it down. You'd rather have someone come in and, and scrub the tile a little bit because you see that mold might be developing. So at the very basic level of maintenance, a fine gardener will come in and, um, for instance, um, here's a plant that looks fine from a distance, but if you hone in and you look at the micro level of that, you will see that there are all these little bugs that are could quite honestly devastate the plant if you don't get them soon. Uh, fine gardeners also do fun things for you. They'll come in and um, do a little bit of a design, change things around a little bit. 
um, add some color. Um, there's one garden that I've worked on that was a complete clean slate. It was a patio of a townhouse, a lot of blank space with the, the, uh, the fence line, no open soil. It was, it was a beautiful little garden, but it was pavers and a fence line. So there's a, a trick that we do in creating uh, container gardens, and that's what we needed clearly in this space because there was no soil, so everything's in pots. And there's a trick that we call the thrill, the fill, and the spill, which ah. means in a container, you're going to start with something large that will just catch your eye. Mm -hmm. Then you fill in the bottom, and you may have something spilling over the edge. You can do that in a pot, mm -hmm. and you can also do that in, in this garden in particular where um, we created some, some thrilling places, some focal point pots and some mm. spilling on the fence line so it wasn't just a blank spot. Not everything's coming up from the bottom, things meet in the middle. And now it's a delightful retreat. It's by a big plate glass window. Mm. The whole wall basically is glass. So it's an extension to the living mm -hmm. room and the owner just loves to look out at any season. So things like that, they create a whole new living space for you. Now, I've also heard the term um, master gardener. Is there a difference between farm gardener and a master gardener? Master gardener is, um, is another certification program that is done through the state, through UC Davis, and it's part of the extension program. It's actually done in every state they do this. The master gardener program is um, a, a very in-depth level of volunteers who are there for you to call on at any moment hotline oh. and they have a breadth of information and resources they can go to and solve problems. So master you. gardeners are actually volunteers? Yes. Yes I they see. are. Now I've also heard people use the term healthy garden. How would you describe a healthy garden and what benefits can we get from such a garden? Gardens look healthy from a distance. If it's green, if it's lush, Everything's all very pretty and consider that healthy. But the truth is that a healthy garden is pretty, can live fairly much on its own. It has um, great nutrients within the soil, that the right plant is in the right place. You don't put a shade plant in the sun, it will mm -hmm. die and burn and look unhappy. Mm -hmm. uh, that the watering system is accurate for the plants that are there. And um, there's so many elements to it, the, the, the soil and the water and the pruning and all things that take some tender, ter some tender care and, and um, attention. Mm -hmm. And why should we learn to appreciate bugs in our garden mm. and avoid chemicals? Bugs are our friends. A lot of people don't like little they creepy collies friends, huh? and they don't like spiders and spiders are the best because they eat the bad guys. If we did not have bugs in our garden, we wouldn't have a garden. And that just down to the basics of pollinization. Um, the, it, it is very unknown, commonly known, how critical bugs are to actually making the garden work. Mm -hmm. And even on a micro level under the ground, little critters in the soil bring the food to the plants. It's not the roots doing all of the work. And when we are spraying, we're killing more than what we really want. Mm. Um, we are spraying on a broad level and killing the bees. Oh. Without the bees, without the little micro level of things, right. there are many safer ways of doing this. Mm -hmm. And back down to the whole pollution and runoff level, it is very important that we're very careful about what we're spraying, not just for the plants. Mm -hmm. You're breathing it. Right. Your dog or your children are rolling in it. Right. And the birds are eating whatever you've done. Mm -hmm. On a very simple and safe level, simple household white vinegar, table salt, and dish soap. And in particular, Dawn, because you want it to stick to the leaf. It won't hurt the plant. But with, with the vinegar, you will kill out weeds. With the just using soap and salt or just using soap, depending on the situation, you'll kill bugs and nothing to it. And it, it's a very safe way of going. You just have your little sprayer. And based on your concoction, it will take care of just about everything that you have going on in your garden. And you can even use it in the house. So some people may not take to the idea of having bugs on their indoor plants. What about 
indoor plants. Indoor plants will get them as well. There are two simple ways of doing that. One, spraying, um, again, with just a very slight soapy water will kill plants to get in on your bugs. Right, but are you saying that we should cultivate bugs on our indoor plants too? No, 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 no. You don't want them by any means. You don't okay. want them. And when you have them, that's an indication that something is off balance. For the most part, you've watered too much or too little. Plant Bugs come, the bad bugs come when the plants are stressed. And you're wanting to pay attention to why that has happened. Check the water levels and such. And based on the, the bug that's come in, it might be that you get a little sticky thing that you set aside and it'll stick to that and you're done. It might be that you need to take the plant outside or put it in the shower and spray it down a little bit. But it doesn't call for uh, insecticides. So we don't need any good bugs on our indoor plants? No. So you, if you just have foliage, you really don't want to see bugs at all. How about the flowering plants, though? We don't need bugs on those either. For the little time that I think a plant will be flowering in your house, you won't have bugs. Ah, good. Okay, that, that eases my mind. Why is the soil the most important part of a garden or a plant container? A, a plant to live requires water and air and food. And all of that, for the most part, is going to come, except for some plants, for the most part, that's going to come from the soil. Mm. In the ground, the critters that we were talking about are moving around, the worms and, and little microbial, they are creating air pockets. They're moving nutrients around. You don't see that, but it's very important to have that happen. And the earth will bring water, it wicks through, and there's an open level for the, for the roots to grow. In a container, this plant, and a container could be a concrete bed in your garden. It could be a big pot or something small. The roots are bound. The water level is bound. So the soil mix in here is very critical, and how the soil is treated is essential for the health of the mm. plant. Oh, I see. You, the plant, the soil will get very compacted mm. in a pot over time. So there are special, uh, a different soil that you would use in a container that has bigger particles and things to let air get in there since the worms aren't there to do it for mm, you. I see. So, so if it is deficient, you can fix that with uh, different soils? Yes. yes, changing the soil is probably the last thing that you would do, but treating the soil on another level. If it's deficient, it's likely food. Oh, I Every see. time you water in a container, you're flushing the food out the bottom. Mm. If you have a saucer, that's great. It'll bring it back up. But consider that you would need to feed a plant more consistently in a pot that you will in the ground. So food is probably the first place to go. Water as well. If you've overwatered, the plant can't breathe, and it'll start dropping its leaves and look sad. So you think of the three elements that the plant needs, the water, the air, and the food. Mm -hmm. Those are the first places to go. So how would I know when my plant, my indoor plant, needs food? Indoor plants, it's good to do on a regular basis. Oh, I and see. And based on what you're using to feed the plant, do it on a monthly level. There are little stakes that you can put in the ground that are in the soil that are a slow release. Put a little tick on your calendar on when you might want to do it again. Some people put a little, and this is where I would highly recommend using a more natural fertilizer. I recommend natural fertilizers everywhere. Right. But inside, the natural fertilizers are going to help bring some of that microbial activity back into the soil. So put a little bit every time you water. Okay. Good advice. Now, how um, important is pruning in your approach to gardening? How you prune a plant will pretty much determine its life, quite honestly. Oh. If we stem back to power tools, um, they have no finesse. There are some very, very talented gardeners who can do all the wonderful shapes and things that is beyond me mm -hmm. to shape things with a power tool. But these are my tools. This is basically what I use in the garden compared to power tools. And um, the, the distinction would be then, if you were to bring a, um, 
a weed whacker or a hedge trimmer and just <laughs> shave off the side of a plant. Mm -hmm. Over time, that shaving compacts itself and it starts growing in on itself and you end up with a very misshapen or actually you can shave the whole side off of a tree it, it, or a shrub, a hedge. It'll never grow back mm. and it creates a problem. Alternatively, um, one of my clients has creeping fig. It's a tiny little vine. It's crawling up the side. It's a very elegant front entry and it's a pretty vigorous grower. You can't go through with a hedge trimmer and lop it off. You can't go through and just grab things and whack it off. It takes a fine tool to get right. in there and snip these little things because we're creating a very delicate edge up his stairway. Mm -hmm. And so there, there are extremes in pruning. If you were to, um, you can misshape a plant dramatically if you cut too deeply. You can kill a plant by cutting too deeply. There's the pencil rule. You don't want to cut anything that's larger than a pencil or your little finger. Oh. On flowering plants, there's a trick called deadheading or pinching. And plants like this will, um, the flowers expire mm -hmm. pretty regularly. Mm -hmm. And if you come at it, um, mow and blow gardeners come through about every week. Fine gardeners might come on a quarterly basis, monthly basis, weekly basis, depends on what you need. But there's a window of time, an interval, that the plant's on its own doing this. So if someone were to come through, say I have a larger pruner even at that, and just sort of snip all this off, you don't see anything, but you've kind of cut through here, and it's all a nice green mm -hmm. globe again. Mm -hmm. But I've just cut all the buds off as well, and you get sticks sometimes. They're not very evident in this, but you get a lot of spikes if you're not very careful in what mm. you cut. Alternatively, and for some plants, this is for something larger. I love these little guys that are narrow, and you can get in and you just take that guy off, and you just take that guy off. And I know that by the time I come back again, this one will be expired, so I'm going to take that one off. Mm. And so I've cleaned the plant and it looks like a natural plant, unless you want this really tight globe. But now I have all these guys mm -hmm. that are going to burst for you in about a week. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of energy that it takes for a plant to produce a flower. And what a plant wants to do is produce a seed. Oh. So if you let it go, like some of these guys I've just cut off, if you mm -hmm. let it go, the energy is going to go into that seed rather than opening these buds up. Oh, I see. So pruning on, on a small level, just for your flowers, a shrub, anything that's flowering, mm -hmm. you really want to focus on producing more buds. On something larger, you don't want to come through and whack a side off because you're exposing the plant to harm, you're exposing it for disease, and it gets pretty unsightly after a while. Mm, that's really good information. Yeah, pruning really does matter. Right, it does. Now, we all know that no plant can exist without water, but how do you determine how much and how often to water? A little on a consistent basis is better than a lot every once in a while. Mm. You can kill a plant with kindness, giving it too much water, and as we talked about earlier, you can bring in bugs and fungus and things that will grow in that, that environment. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, so a little or a lot can really hurt you. So there are kind of two tests that you can use. One is the finger test, where you actually can just stick your finger in the soil. If it's cool, you'll know that it's moist. You can take a spoon in your house plant or another tool and wiggle it a little bit, and you want to see it darker. Gardeners develop a feel for the soil. Mm -hmm. They develop a relationship with the soil and they can stick their finger in at any time and know exactly what's going on. There's some tools that you can use that are simple. We have um, this little ceramic worm that you keep in the pot all the time. And rather than getting to know the soil, you know the little worm. Ah. When he's a darker color, he's moist, soil's moist, plant's happy. If he's this pale, dry ceramic color, they both need water. I see. There are nice little tricks that, um, like this little guy, the bird, 
you fill the little well with water and you leave it. And when the well's empty, you fill the well. Oh. And then whatever apparatus they have below will slowly emit the water and the soil oh. will wick it in. And there's a good balance created by that little tool. Oh, I see. And again, this is more maybe for a gardener level. There are meters, there are probes that you place the probe in the soil and the meters tell you whether it's wet or dry. Oh, I see. But these guys make your life pretty easy. Right, that yeah. looks like it. Yeah. They're cute too. Yeah, they're fun, <laughs> they're fun, and they're just, just little tricks. Now, how can the fine gardener help a client maintain a healthy garden during exceptional periods of drought? We are in an exceptional drought. Uh, I am, and I would do this even if we weren't in a drought. I'm a huge proponent of, well, it's very critical that we get the right amount of water to the right plant. Not only in a drought situation, creating that, but you'll kill the plant. But when we're really hurting for water, I'm a huge proponent of drip irrigation rather than spray irrigation. So other than your lawn, if you have water going directly to the plant, and it's just watering the plant. You have much more control. You're not watering the soil that's around it and has nothing to do with the plant. It's not blowing off into the air. Mm -hmm. For watering your lawn, there are, in the county, the, the water company have great programs for trading things out to trade your water system to something that's more efficient. There are um, different heads, different emitters that won't just miss the water out and blow it away. So the type of irrigation is very critical. The time that you water is very critical because if you're watering after 6 a.m., you'd be shocked at how much is either blowing away to your neighbor mm. or it's um, evaporating from the heat of the day, which is also detrimental to the plant. Mm -hmm. So the time and the placement and how you water through this drought are three very critical things to consider. Another thing that's tough, but we really need to do this, is it may be that you give up some of the annuals or someone who requires a lot of water because it's much easier to replace than a tree or a favorite shrub or mm -hmm. something that, that uh, when we get more water, we'll be happier that thing would survive right. and we'll get back to normal. Right. But being very efficient is very critical. Now, very quickly, um, how do you determine the level and kind of fine gardener service that it client needs? Because I know you must have lots of different types of clients. You, I just, when I meet a client, meet a gardener, I listen. It's really important to know how that person wants to live with the garden, how they want to interact with it. It might be they want to just see it through a window. It might be that they want to sit in it and enjoy it and, and play in it or have a space for a, a child or a dog. Or You really need to listen to the owner of the garden, owners of the garden, right. and how they want to use it. Right. So you have to be a good listener. Absolutely. And thinking of the needs of seniors, what services can a fine gardener provide that will make a senior client more motivated and enthusiastic about maintaining their outdoor and or indoor garden as they grow older? On a senior level is, again, to look at the space, hear what they want, Maybe it's something that they just can't get at anymore. Maybe it's somebody come in and work with me and you do the hard stuff, mm -hmm. let them do the fun stuff. Maybe um, it's a matter like the woman whose um, patio became this wonderful container garden. It's create a space for me, create, recreate some memories for me. So bringing in and, and again, listening to what someone wants. And it's also nice to bring in something that you'll think will engage them in the garden mm -hmm. and bring them out to enjoy the garden and right. to share the garden. And, and, and that's true for people of any age, For right? anyone, for right. anyone in particular. But on a senior level, for anyone who's aging or who can't get to the garden any longer, it's harder to do things. Right. It's, you still want to enjoy it visually. At right. the very least, you want to see it. Absolutely. Now, the benefits of plant therapy has been documented since ancient times, I understand. And it's been identified as a way to assist seniors to, who choose to age in place in their own homes. Mm -hmm. What exactly is plant therapy? Plant therapy 
builds on what we were just talking about for anyone, any, anyone who has the garden and wants to develop an experience with the garden. But for someone who's aging, who is perhaps injured, just isn't capable of getting into the garden like they might have mm -hmm. in the past, and there's not as much to do in the day. But if you have a garden, who isn't happy in a garden? So if you have a garden, there's a physical demand. It could be a little, it could be a lot, but there's something physical to get you up and tend to that plant. Mm -hmm. There is a motivation to add a little bit more. Mm -hmm. There is um, a reason to share your garden. There is something you visually want to see. You're going to start paying attention to the bugs. You'll be challenged by the bugs. So plant therapy is engaging. It's engaging physically, it's a little physical therapy mm -hmm, to keep mm -hmm. your hands going right. and maybe you have an arthritic hand and, and using mm -hmm. pruners. There's some very lovely orthotic pruners that could help someone in that regard. And it's invigorating on a, on a soulful level, on a mindful level, on an intellectual level. So on several different levels. Absolutely, absolutely. So now if I'm looking for a fine gardener, where do I go about looking for one? Um, word of mouth is probably the best and ask your neighbors, ask your friends if they know of someone in doing that. Um, there are community, community boards and such that will put out notices or give you resources for that, call the master gardeners. And just very quickly, what qualities and uh, qualifications, professional knowledge should we be looking for in a fine gardener? There's so many knowledgeable people in this area. There's so many wonderful people that I've met who love, they specialize in veggie gardens. And they, they specialize in, you know, from roses to taking lawns out to water-wise. And it really depends on your intention. But I bring it down to, I think that the chemistry between you and that person is what you most want to Very, remember. very good advice. And you've yeah. given us so much to think about, so much good information. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Jenny. It's a delight. I always love sharing anything about gardening. Wonderful. I hope you've enjoyed our program today. And be sure to also watch our shows on YouTube and Roku. See you again next week. And happy gardening.